The 26.2 Foundation is a nonprofit organization that promotes and supports the sport of marathoning. Prior to this year's Boston Marathon, they hosted a meet and greet with three Boston Marathon legends at the Hopkinton Country Club. 1968 Boston Marathon winner, Amby Burfoot, four-time Boston Marathon winner, Bill Rogers, and the featured guest was Bobby Gibb, who 50 years ago, the year 1966, became the first woman to ever cross the Boston Marathon finish line. We now bring you all the 26.2 Foundation festivities on this edition of HCAM News Focus. take a couple of minutes. There's another anniversary this year, in addition to your 50th. Uh, in 1946, Celianos Karakidis came from Greece uh, and won the Boston Marathon. And uh, we have a Hopkinton resident who, uh, amongst other things, is a very good photographer who would like to make a presentation to Dimitri Karakidis. Tom? Sure. Tom Sloan. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, Dimitri, as you know, at the one mile mark on the Boston Marathon course in Hopkinton stands the statue, the spirit of the marathon. This statue commemorates the victory that your father achieved 70 years ago by winning the 50th Boston Marathon. He ran that day against the advice of medical professionals and against all odds, he won that day. But you know, on that day he was a champion. But you know, and we know, he was more than just a champion. Stilianos was a patriot. He risked his life during World War II, serving with the Greek resistance, fighting the tyranny of the Nazis, and the, the occupation and oppression of his beloved country and its people. And he continued to serve his country 
by his good deeds and his charitable giving. Stylianos was also a great humanitarian. He used his fame and his achievements not to further his own fortunes, but to advocate for those who could not advocate for themselves. Following his victory in Boston in 1946, he successfully lobbied the President, Harry S. Truman, and the U.S. government to send aid to Greece, to feed, to clothe, and help rebuild the country that he so loved. Two years ago, I captured an image of that statue that stands at the one mile mark of the marathon. And to me, this image represents the undying light of the spirit, of Stylianos' spirit. And that spirit is the spirit that beats in the hearts of all great men and women. That's the spirit to overcome, to achieve, and most of all, to serve. And I'm humbled tonight to present to you this gift on behalf of the 26.2 Foundation. And to me, this is an image that the, an image of the statue that represents the hope and the inspiration that he truly was to millions of people from his home country and around the world. And I have no doubt that his spirit lives on in you. So I ask you to accept this gift on behalf of the 26.2 Foundation. This is, uh, if anybody, if anybody symbolizes the spirit of Stellianos Karakis, it's, it's Dimitri. And I wonder if you'd, uh, what do you think? What do you think about this? I am speechless, really. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this incredible gift. Um, I try to be here every year since 2006 uh, to pay tribute to my father and come closer to him. Because every time I went this afternoon, I was there and I laid a, 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 an olive branch on his statue. And that brings me closer to him. Um, he was a great runner, of course, before and after the war. He was a unique runner because very few of you know how far ahead of his time he was he was the first man to use stopwatch, hand stopwatch, hand stopwatch in 1934. The next, the next top, uh, stopwatch, and I'm going to ask Bill actually later on, I see him there. I think it's about 1980 or something. I think he's the next man who to, to use a hand stopwatch. Uh, but he was, he, he, he thought about um, that you, you, you cannot run a marathon without a program, a plan and you cannot run without a pace. So he used the stopwatch. He bought books in 1935 in London, uh, published by uh, Webster, and he was the first man to use stretching exercises. In 1938, I have photos of my father stretching in Boston. 38, 1938. And the, the stretching came out a long time after, Bill, right? <laughs> He also um, used the books to uh, learn about diet. 1935, my father was eating special food because he knew to run a 42-kilometer uh, or 26-mile uh, race, you've got to have a plan, you have to have a good uh, body, you have a good mind. You know, uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, newspaper clippings of the time uh, from American newspaper, Boston Globe, that, you know, they see this stopwatch in his hand 
which he never took out, took off. Uh, and they said to him, what is this? He says, it's a stopwatch. They say, what? I mean, the American, now American reporters were asking, why are you using it? And my father said, how can I run without a plan? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and uh, in 1946, of course, when uh, he ran Boston and uh, when he crossed the line, the finish line, he said, for Greece. And he meant it. He didn't come here to run for himself and uh, win so many things that he could have won at the time, material-wise. Uh, he said, I came here to run for my country. And of course, the American people responded, the government and the ordinary people responded and they sent this incredible help to Greece. Many of the Athenians and the Greek people survived uh, after the war because of this aid. So um, I want to thank the American people for this. In 1947, he was the first, uh, in 46 then, he is the first man to run for charity. Right? This was a charity thing. And in 1947, he is the first man to run for a cause. He comes back to Boston. He's 37 years old. He doesn't have very much hope to win. But he comes here simply because Greece was in the middle of a civil war and uh, there was no money to send the Greek national team to the Olympic Games in 1948, the first Olympic Games after the war. Can you imagine Olympic Games without the Greek team coming in first? <laughs> so he comes here and he goes again uh, to the White House and he begs for help and the White House again responds and sends uh, athletic equipment and clothing for the team to train and $50,000 so that can have the money to go to the Olympics. So he was unique and uh, he was a patriot and a humanitarian because until he died at the age of uh, 77 uh, he gave. He never thought about what is it? What is it in it for me? It's what is it in it for us all the time? And I just finished by telling you a very funny story. Seven was his lucky number. You all know that uh, he was offered bib number one uh, because he was the Greek. <laughs> but he said, "No, no, I want uh, seventy-seven." So they said, why? He said, because seven was the lucky number of the ancient Greeks. So if I have two sevens, I can be double lucky. <laughs> so he, he wins with number uh, 77 in two hours, 29 minutes and 27 seconds. He dies at the age of 77 in the year 1987. Wow. Now, very recently I did some more research and I found out that 1940, uh, until 1946, Boston Marathon was run on the 19th of April, no matter what the day was. Except if there was a problem somewhere and they postponed it for the 20th of April. Now, 1946, they ran it on the 20th of April, which is the seventh time that it, it's been postponed. <laughs> And the day is Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. <laughs> and Kyriakidis is the 35th individual winner of the Boston Marathon 1946, which means five times seven. <laughs> Thank you. some uh, marathon icons in just a, a few minutes, but there are a couple of people that I would like to uh, make sure we uh, acknowledge. Uh, the first is uh, a gentleman who was the executive director of the Boston Athletics Association for 25 plus years. Um, he took over after a rather tumultu tumultuous uh, period in the history of the Boston Marathon. And I want you to say hello to Guy Morris. We have a book in front of you by Emmy that talks about uh, pioneers in, uh, in women's running. Um, and you'll get to meet some of those people in a second. 
but there is a woman who's been uh, behind the scenes in the BAA for a couple of years. A couple of years. She she always she always looks at me askance when I I, I remember distinctly uh, Gloria being in a room with her buddies stuffing pins into plastic bags uh, to for the runners back a long quite a while ago. Uh, probably back into, yeah, yeah, back that far. But um, she is uh, currently a member of the uh, Board of Governors of the Boston Athletic Association, and that's Gloria Ratty. A couple of quick things before Andy gets up. Everybody has, a, hopefully, a raffle ticket. We'll, we have a little raffle uh, after the program. We uh, want to make sure you all have a raffle ticket. If you don't, we'll get one to you. But now, for the uh, for the moment that you've all... Sarah May? We'll, get, well, we'll make sure Sarah May gets one. Uh, the moment you've all been waiting for. To, uh, to lead a, a discussion, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, you know, a person that's a... I, one of the, one of the, the things I think we can, I can honestly say about him, um, he's an absolute gentleman. Um, he's um, distinguished himself, not only as a Boston Marathon winner, but also as a, as a writer and, a, and an author. You're all familiar with Runner's World magazine. He will disagree with what I'm about to say, but he is one of the reasons that Runner's World magazine is the global magazine that it is today. And it is a... It, Uh, to have uh, it's nutmeg. That's where we're both from. In Bill, Bill, the same way. It's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to to uh, introduce to you Emmy Burford. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, Bill and Bobby, you can kind of come up now and find a seat, and we'll get to you both in just a moment. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It's been a thrill all my lifetime to be able to be at Runner's World and tell the stories of wonderful athletes like Bill and Bobby. And uh, Stilianos preceded me by a few years, but I think it's quite wonderful this evening. We just heard this story about how in 1946 he came here to run the marathon, uh, essentially for his country. And 20 years later, I think we could even say that Bobby Gibb came to run the Boston Marathon for her people, which were all the women here in the room and all the women who have run since then. But the wonderful thing about Bobby, as she will tell you, is she wasn't just running for womankind, but for, for all humanity, to bring all of us closer together and to bridge the sometimes tension and battle of the sex stuff. That's not who she is. She's about humanity and unanimity and everyone being together on the same page. Tim did leave me a couple of people who I could uh, introduce, and that's why uh, he didn't go too far with one of the previous uh, names. Is Tom Dedarian still here? Where are you, Tom? Here. Tom Dedarian. He's kind of the unofficial historian of the Boston Marathon. He's also working on the official Boston Marathon movie, which will be released next year. And the scope of this project that Tom and others have been working on is just astonishing when this thing comes out. Uh, we're all going to be in line as we were tonight to get through the door and see this. It's going to be something very, very special. John's not still here, is he? No. No. The, uh, John's, uh, John Dunham, who's working with Tom, had to leave earlier. And uh, before we get to the uh, media program, uh, many of you have been reading about Bobby Gibb this week in the newspapers and seeing on TV. And of course, she won three Boston marathons in a row, not just one. Not just 66, but 66, 67, and 68. Three in a row, uh, three Pete. And we also have in the room 
the local runner from Cambridge, Mass, who took up where Bobby left off and won the next three in a row, 69, 70, and 71. And not only that, but she drove me and Bobby out here with her husband today, so we wouldn't be here without Sarah Mae Berman. this week. But, uh, before we go any further, do you mind? Um, we have, uh, we're fortunate in Hopkinton to have uh, some state elected officials that are absolutely terrific. Um, and our state representative is here. And if you don't mind, we'd like to butt in. And uh, I'd like to introduce Representative Carolyn Dykema, who has a presentation. <laughs> I feel terribly interrupting the program. I'm really uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I have to announce, just for the record, that I am one of Bobby's people for sure, even though I am not a runner. Uh, it is really uh, remarkable to be here in Hopkins to the week before the marathon because the energy in the room um, here, you can feel it, is just palpable. And the history here in the room is just remarkable from Stilianos Kariakides and his incredibly rich history around the marathon and Bobby Gibb and her incredibly rich history around the Boston Marathon. And I will say, as a woman myself, I take a particular pride in being able to recognize you today, Bobby, with a citation from the legislature. And I also want to recognize, as was done earlier, um, I see a lot of young women in the room. And it is so important um, for these young women to be here to see you and see that um, it's always possible. And don't ask, and I think it was John Coutinho who said earlier, don't ask why, ask why not. And I think there is no better role model for these young women uh, in following that, following your dream, in breaking the barriers, and in creating your own reality. So that's really why we're here um, celebrating with you tonight, celebrating your accomplishments, and celebrating all of those women who looked to you and what you did and decided to do their own thing. And thankfully, we're here today, and quite frankly, can't even imagine, I think most of us, ever having a time when it was not proper to run. I can't imagine that. And which is exactly what you said um, was the case back in the day. So thanks to people like Bobby, you have broken the barriers for all the and you're so very grateful. So on behalf of the Massachusetts Legislature, can you come up so I can, well, you know what, I'll come to you, how's that? Great, I'm gonna officially present you with a, a citation on behalf of the Massachusetts House of Representatives and on behalf of Senator Spilka, who is certainly here with us in spirit, but she could not be here with us tonight. But it reads, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers the sincerest congratulations to Roberta Bobby Gibb in recognition of your pioneering leadership in women's athletics and your work to honor the female runners of the Boston Marathon with a permanent installation. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success given this day, the 13th day of April 2016, at the State House, signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, and Carolyn Dykema, State Representative. So, Bobby, to you, cheers, congratulations, and thank you for all you've done. Today. that was well worth it. I'm glad we got that onto the program. Thank you for your spontaneous thoughts and for the proclamation as well. Uh, certainly appropriate on this occasion. So uh, again, we're going to start right in. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, as I said, you're here at a kind of a historic gathering. I don't really remember a time when Bill Rogers and Bobby and I have been together in, in such an intimate place as this where we can really talk to you and of course Primarily, I must say, Bill, it ain't about you and me tonight. <laughs> Just 
just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know that this is Bill Rogers, four-time winner of the Boston Marathon, New York City Marathon, and the guy who launched the running boom in America. This is Bill Rogers. Great to be here in Hopkinton, in particular, for all the reasons related to the marathon, but because Roberta is finally getting this great acclaim. And, uh, and, and, and it, 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 I guess, and Tim Kilduff, and 26.2 Foundation, and everyone who works in the foundation, we all salute you. We can't wait to see the sculpture. <coughs> Talented artist. Scientist, you know, she's quite an interesting person. <laughs> but, you know, it's just great, you know, it's, it's amazing. Why did that happen? And maybe we can talk about that. Why, why aren't, I, I was always amazed, sort of, why isn't she known as the first woman to run the Boston Marathon? Great to be here tonight. <laughs> thank, thank you, Bill. I, I make one other note. I had a half dozen different people come up to me tonight and say, you know, everybody in Hopkinton runs. Yeah. And I was like, I'm almost believing you people now. <laughs> so many said that. I know it's not literally true, but obviously this marathon, this wonderful, great marathon would not exist without the total support of the people of Hopkinton. So we're very, very happy, not just that you run for yourselves, your fitness to run the Boston Marathon maybe, but because you support the Boston Marathon and its history in so many ways. So thank you for that. Tonight is Bobby's story, so I want to just launch into it. I'm simply going to ask Bobby a couple of questions to make it easy for her to tell the story. Uh, I hope you've read it in the newspapers or seen it on TV recently, but even if you have, it's not nearly as good as hearing it first person from the woman who actually had to live those experiences. So do you have a microphone there, Bobby? You're ready to go. So. Why don't you tell us about your efforts to enter the Boston Marathon in February or so of 1966? Okay, but first of all, I don't need this one. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Bambi, and you, Bill, and Tim, and all the incredible team, Jackie, and all the people who actually have done this. Um, I didn't do anything. They, they, they just spontaneously came together and decided to do this, and I'm just really, really moved and touched, and thank you all for coming. It, it's amazing <laughs> and wonderful. So, yeah, now, back. 1966, I'm gonna take this off your hand so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Uh, how did it feel when what? <laughs> no. Tell us, I mean, you tried to get enter. You tried to get into the race. Well, I, I trained. I trained for two years to run the Boston Marathon, and including a 3,000 mile uh, trip with a, in a Volkswagen microbus and my Malamon puppy across the country. And at night, I slipped out under the stars and. In the, during the days, I ran wherever I was. I just was in love with this country. And I ran out across Massachusetts and Ohio and across the Mississippi and out over the Great Plains. And I had never seen the plains before. And I ran up the Rocky Mountains. And I was getting stronger and stronger and running further and further. And it was kind of a spiritual journey, too, because I. Uh, I would see a, a mountain in the distance and I would run to the top of the mountain and back. But I was looking for something deeper than we had in the 50s and the 60s in suburban life. Women were very restricted and constricted. It was almost impossible for women to get into medical school or law school. And for a grown woman to run, God forbid, in public was uh, improper and way outside the social norm. And um, so for me to be doing this was, was way outside the social norm. And, but I was looking for something deeper in life, uh, kind of a, I love nature and I was getting back into something very basic. And um, I always been interested, for, I think from a very early age, it's always been amazing to me that this world actually exists. And, and I, uh, and I was looking for, like, how does, it, how does this world exist? The earth, 
and the stars and the solar system and us here, we don't make ourselves. We're born and I study biology and I look at the cell and I say, wow, this is an incredible thing that's just emerging out of the universe, out of these atoms and molecules get together and make these cells that become living creatures. And this was so fascinating to me. And so I was looking for a deeper meaning of life and I was in love with the earth and I was in love with the stars and I fell asleep every night looking up at the stars and I was feeling like, wow, this is my home, this whole universe. And there's nothing between us and the very furthest reaches of, of the universe. And I thought, this goes on and on and on forever. And to me, it just seemed like this incredible miracle. And I wanted to experience it more and more and deeper. And I say, how did all this get to be here? And why is it here? And I, I didn't know. And I still don't know. But, but every time I realize that I don't know, I'm I'm in awe of it. I'm in awe of the fact that it all exists and that we exist. And, and so this was why I was taking this trip. And this is also why I run, and it's why I do my artwork, and it's why I do my research. And it's even why I did law, because I was interested in environmental law. And I love people, and I love the environment, and I thought maybe I could help to make things better. Um, if I could, if I could practice law, and if I could work on environmental law and, and legislation, I, I was a legal aide for a while in the le legislature, and, and and so I know that the people who work in our government um, are dedicated to helping us all have better lives. And I know there's a lot of people that are cynical about politics, but the people I know in government are the most hardworking um, people who are concerned with the common good. And so I guess I've always wanted to make a better world and to have a better world. And my next project is to end war. That's <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, but, you know, so I hope I live a, a, a few more years. So, met Bobby that until you hear her speak, you would not actually believe that anybody could come up with the words that come out of her mouth. When she starts speaking, you guys got a pretty good dose of that, which is wonderful. But I'm going to try and draw her back to <laughs> just to the Boston Marathon 1966, maybe, because that's a pretty historic evening, uh, that's a pretty historic date for this evening. So Bobby, this, these days the, the top runners fly in from around the world. I don't know if the BAA gives them a first class ticket or not, but they get in a week early and they have training camps and all that sort of stuff. Why don't you tell us how you got to the Boston Marathon in 1966? Okay, I took a Greyhound bus. <laughs> from California, three days and three nights, uh, I subsisted on bus station chili and a bag of apples. <laughs> I got to the St. James station and I called my parents. Uh, I had recently been married, that's why I was in San Francisco, my husband was in the Navy. And I was against the Vietnam War, but he was in the Navy, uh, so uh, he was against the war too. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I came back <laughs> and I arrived the day before the, the actually it's the night, I guess, I arrived before the race. I called my parents from the St. James Station and they said, well, where are you? And this trembly little voice, I, I went, and my mother, my mother, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in Boston. And, well, why? Well, I came to run the Boston Marathon. <laughs> and, of course, I hadn't told my parents that I was training for the Boston Marathon because I knew they would think I was nuts and they would try to stop me. So the only people that knew were my boyfriend and a couple of my close women friends. And what? You're married. You're married. <laughs> no, I I am very exclusive. I do one at a time. Before I was 
married. <laughs> this goes over a period of several years. In fact, he was my boyfriend before I married him. <laughs> so... I have an idea. Let's, let's go out to Hopkinton. <laughs> Seriously, you got to your yeah. parents. Okay. Yes. Please buy the book. Yes. Buy the book. Uh, I, I don't know how popular it is to be anti-war in this room with Bobby, but uh, Bill and I were conscientious objectors too. So. Talk to your mother into driving you to Hopkins. Okay. And then. <laughs> okay, but aren't you going to tell me? Aren't you going to let me tell what my dad thought? <laughs> okay. My dad actually thought that I was delusional. That I had gone around the bend. I was crazy. Poor, poor daughter. Um, thinks she's going to run the Boston Marathon, and so he was went steaming out of the house. He was really angry because he thought I might actually try something like that and kill myself. But I convinced my mother, who was uh, kind of a repressed housewife, she's a very intelligent, beautiful woman, very talented, and she'd kind of given up her dreams to be a housewife. And so I said, Mom, you know, this is gonna help to set women free. And suddenly it rang a bell with her, and for the first time in her life, instead of trying to get me to conform to the deadening social norms, that had made her so unhappy, she was actually on my side. And she drove me to Hopkinton and let me out, and I ran and ran around Hopkinton for trying to figure out how I was going to get into this thing. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. I thought I might be arrested. And I, I knew if the officials saw me, they would stop me. And that was my biggest fear, was that was being stopped, and I wouldn't be able to prove what I came to prove. So, it was a catch-22, was that how can you prove you can do something if you're not allowed to do it? That's what I was up against. And so, uh, tell us about where you hid in Hopkinton, so everyone can go find the bushes. <laughs> the historic site this year, as long as there are no guys in there doing their thing before you I know you're from Hopkinton, you know what happens in the starting line. Uh, and um, what it was like to jump into the crowd of men runners when they went by. Well, I, I, I saw the crowd gathering of runners, and then I ran around. I thought you had to warm up. <laughs> and so I went out behind some buildings, and I ran up and down probably maybe 40, 45 minutes. <laughs> Uh, no, after a bus trip, I was a little bit cramped. So I, was running, I was running up and down. <laughs> uh, so then, as the time for the race drew near, I went back to the bushes, and um, and then the starting gun went. The men started, and I jumped into the mi middle of the race, and I didn't know what was going to happen because the men could have easily shouldered me out. Um, then very soon, the men studying my anatomy from the rear uh, <laughs> realized that I was a woman. And it took them about three minutes. <laughs> Even with my brother's baggy Bermuda shorts. So, anyway, so I smiled and said, yes, I, uh, I'm a girl. And so they, so, um, they said, well, I wish my wife would run. I wish my girlfriend would run. And so they were friendly and supportive and so that was great and this was my whole idea that men and women can do things together that a stupid war between the sexes is a ridiculous waste of time and that we're all completely unique individuals and we don't have to fit into these stereotypes and and they really understood that and supported that and and so then i wanted to take the my hood off because it was getting hot and I said, I'm afraid if they see I'm a woman, they'll throw me out. And they said, we won't let them throw you out. It's a free road. So they were friendly and protective. And they felt like my brothers and we were pals. And it just, it just shows you that we don't have to be doing a war between the sexes. It is, so it was great.
Whenever I tell this part of the story uh, to my wife, I say to her, I usually add, you have no idea how much time we men runners have been studying you women from the rear. <laughs> out of women about 3.5 seconds <laughs> no time at all. Impressive. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are ever impressive. Uh, <laughs> I've always thought so. <laughs> so Bill, I, maybe we can work you in here. I'm not, I'm not sure. I can either ask you how long it takes you to step out of women's anatomy or um, you, well, you, you, go ahead. You know, Amy, well, Amy and Amy, I started running in '63, so I, we were we're all about the same era, but um, and I but I remember going to a few road races. But before I continue, I just want to thank Amy because I wouldn't be here without Amy Burfa, because I would never have had a chance to become a marathoner and actually win this this race. You know, so 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 thank you, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> Good role model all time, and uh, for sure. But, but 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 I said last night we were on TV um, yeah, with Jim right. Browdy on um, Channel Two, and, and I said Roberta didn't have any role models, so so it, it, it was a different world. I, I really can't understand that. <laughs> but but um, what did you ask me? <laughs> I just wanted to get Roberta a rest. And, uh, okay. we'll, we will come back. I, I do want to note that uh, I'm always, since I've been running even longer than these two, I think, uh, I'm always asked how has running changed over the years, and what did you think when those women started showing up at road races in the mid-60s? And I always say, listen, I was a skinny, geeky, four eyes, uh, couldn't get a date to save my life. What do you think I thought about attracting young women showing up at our road races? Of course, I thought it was tremendous. And so did everyone else, and, and not for the reasons that we've been joking about, but because actually in the 60s, Bill and I and people like us, we felt like social outcasts, Larry and Sarah May. We were fringe elements. Uh, more people in Boston made fun of us for going the Boston Marathon than applauded us for, for going the distance the way they do now. So of course, we were happy to have any elements of uh, society in the race. Uh, with us and women is, was a very good addition, a very good element to have out there. I'm going to tell one story and we'll go back to Bobby. Recently I wrote a, a very extensive story for Runner's World about Bobby's race in 1966. And in doing that I thought that I would, it would be fun to try and find some guys who had actually seen her in the race in 1966. And there were several people pictured in some famous photos of that year's race. Unfortunately, when I reached their families, they had passed away in the last year or two. But I found about three guys who saw Bobby at various points in the race. And I said to them, well, what do you remember? What did she look like? What, what was going through your mind when you saw her? And one of them, they all said, at first we thought it was some joker. You know, we thought it was an early Rosie Ruiz and she was just going to go a few blocks. But then we watched her run and we realized, oh my gosh, she can really run, she can run the hills, she's got strength, she's got endurance. We figured she was going the distance and looking very, very good doing it. Two of them said, it was a real bruise to my male ego when she went flying by me on Heartbreak Hill. <laughs> and yet, there she was doing it and more power to her uh, for that. So it was fun to actually reach people who had seen Bobby in, in the race that year and could comment on the fact that one of them said it was obvious that she had really, really trained for this event because she ran so strongly. So you were having a great race. You, you, you got to Wellesley. What were Wellesley and maybe Heartbreak Hill like? Oh uh, yeah, Wellesley was great. Um, my progress along the ra race was being broadcast by a local radio station, so the Wellesley women knew I was coming. And I know this because I may, in 1996, I met Diana Chapman Walsh, uh, who was, in 1966, was one of the cheer cheering women along the course, and then became the, the president. And so she wrote a very nice piece for the paper, and she told me that the women were waiting for me and looking for me. And when 
I came in sight, they let out a huge scream. I could hear all this going on in the distance, and I didn't know what it was at first. Uh, it sounded like a day at the beach. <laughs> now, I, uh, I asked the men around me, and uh, there were some murmurs about the tunnel of love. <laughs> oh, and so I got there. I guess the women called it the screech tunnel. And so um, the women, had, in those days, they came, came right out into the street. They put their arms up and made a tunnel, and you had to kind of duck down and go through it. And, and the women were yelling and screaming, and, and some of them were tears in their eyes, and there was one older woman with a bunch of kids around her going, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. <laughs> and it was very moving. I mean, there were tears in my eyes. And I felt as though things had real, were really changed. And Diana Chapman Walsh said it too. She said, somehow we all knew that, that, that everything had changed. We were, we were not going to go back into those little boxes that we'd been put in before that. And um, so, yeah, I ran on into Boston. And I was feeling really good. I kept holding myself back, knowing that I would have to conserve energy because I had a lot of responsibility. And I knew if I failed to finish, I would actually set women back, you know, 50 years or more. And so I, I was holding myself back, but the guys around me were telling me we were on a sub three hour race for most of the race, but um, I, had, I didn't know he was supposed to drink water. <laughs> and so I had drunk no water, it was a fairly hot day. But worst of all, I had new running shoes, new boys running shoes. I, I had trained in nurses' shoes, because those are the only women's shoes that were sturdy enough to run in in those days. And I should have just worn those, but my friend Bill Gookin in San Diego said, no, they're too heavy to race in. You should get boys' running shoes, so I did. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't know you were supposed to break them in, so I had, by the time I got to about mile 20, 20, you know, maybe 20, it started blisters, horrible blisters. So the last three miles, my feet were excruciatingly painful, and I was just tiptoeing along, and my pace really ran out, and I thought, oh gosh, I don't think anyone's even gonna be at the finish by the time I got there. But no, I came down Hereford Street, and I turned on the Boylston Street, and the crowds were all there, and the press and everything, they let out a cheer when they saw me, and so I ran down the finish line, and there was, the governor of Massachusetts came down and shook my hand, and, and the next day it was front page headlines that, uh, that a woman had actually run the Boston Marathon and run it in fairly good time, finished at, at least ahead of two thirds of the guys. Yeah, but I wasn't racing against the guys. And then I uh, took it, well, the press came around and they wanted to know why I was running and everything. And so I was trying not to appear like a total, like crackpot or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell them why I was running. And, and they, they really got the idea that I was running. You know, I said I was running for the fun of it because I love to run and, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I had just fallen in love with this race and I wanted to be part of it. And, so when I got home, I took a taxi home, and I got to my street, and um, there were cars everywhere, and I thought, gee, it looks like somebody's having a party. <laughs> and I got to my house, and it was the press. They were all at my house. And my poor parents were standing there in the middle of the living room looking totally bewildered. Like, what is this daughter of hers <laughs> and, um, and so my dad said something to the effect of, uh, well, we knew she could do it. <laughs> and I, I put my arm around him and I said, it was those gib legs, Dad. <laughs> anyway, so it was fun. And you know, it really changed my mother's life because she went on to get her master's degree in sociology and get a job and um, joined the peace movement in the 80s and 
she went to the then Soviet Union, and um, of course that was the whole, you know, uh, what would you call it, this insanity of the nuclear arms race was going on, and nobody knew how to stop it, and um, a bunch of women got together and figured uh, it's time to stop it, and started reaching out and having sister city programs, and. Um, cultural exchanges and stuff. So my mom was really part of it. I was part of it too, but she really took the lead on there. And I, so I, she really, it really changed her life and opened it, opened her up. There's a part of the story where Bobby gets home that evening, and the newspaper reporters, the photographers, are all over the house, and they've already got pictures of her running in the race that day. So now they've been told to get some different kind of picture of you at home. Oh uh, yes, this you know people think in stereotypes. So this is it: women bake cookies. <laughs> <laughs> women do not run marathons, and so you have these two images of women, and they just couldn't they couldn't get it into their minds that a woman <coughs> could actually run a marathon. So that so they asked me to put on a dress. Which I did. I put on a polka dotted dress and uh, and cooked some fudge in the, <laughs> in the kitchen. So there's in the in the paper there's like there's a picture of me running the marathon in my Bermuda, my brother's Bermuda shorts, and then right under it is a picture of me in a polka dotted dress making fudge. <laughs> so, you know, somehow they're going to get these two pictures together. Thank goodness the woman had some practical talent. Right? Uh, Tim or anyone else with the committee here, if we need to get yanked off, let me know. Otherwise, I will wind things down in five or, five or ten minutes. Uh, earlier we had people from Girls on the Run here. I don't, I'm not sure if they are still here. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization. They've done so much in the, I don't know, 10 or 15 years of their existence, and they're all over the country, and they're just phenomenal. The lessons they teach everywhere. When I wrote the book, First Ladies of Running, which many of you received tonight, I was astonished to look deeply at the women, and particularly the first crop in the first 10 years went on to become doctors, get PhDs, do research, uh, do incredible organizational and corporate work in some cases. So obviously they weren't just running geeks like me and Bill who couldn't do anything else, but they were <laughs> women of tremendous talent. And, and Roberta, uh, I would like you to talk a little bit about your life beyond uh, running. She did come back and run two more years, 67 and 68, and win. And I looked up some old marathon statistics when I was doing this story. 16 years later, when you were in your late 30s, you ran 319 at the New York City Marathon, which nobody's ever looked into, but she was still running strongly 20 years later. So how did your running and your curiosity and your professional life kind of work together somehow? Well, um, I will. I've always been interested in everything. I've always wanted to know how everything works. Like what is electricity, how, you know, when I, even when I was a little kid. My dad was a brilliant scientist. He was a chemist and was a professor at Tufts. So, he, so <clears throat> I would ask him all kinds of questions and go out in nature. He gave me a microscope when I was just a little kid and I'd go up and look at pond water and amoebas and everything. So I was always interested. I loved science. I always loved science. It was very hard for women to get into the sciences in those days. And um, I, studied, I was studying physics and mathematics and chemistry and all the things. And partly is because I've always felt that for women to really move ahead, women have to take on the challenging things and show that they can do them. And, um, but it was mostly because I loved, I loved those things and I was curious and I wanted to know how everything worked. And, <clears throat> and um, so I studied science, and then I went to art school because I loved art. It, when I think about it, all the things I loved, I was doing as a, like when I, I was three years old, I started to run and I never stopped. And I started to do my artwork when I was four and I never stopped. And I started asking questions and being interested in science. And I just never stopped. It's just been this long, continuous path. And so then, um, what did I do? Then I went to the University of California 
and I was in pre-med, and I uh, took all organic chemistry and prepared to go to medical school. I was interested in doing scientific research, and I went for my, uh, for my uh, interview, and they told me I was too pretty to go to medical school. I'd, I'd upset the boys in the lab, and they had to save the places for the men who were actually going to practice medicine. That was in 1969. And, um, and then I, I didn't know what to do. Well, I, uh, I did actually end up marrying a doctor, just as they had predicted. <laughs> and um, I read all his medical textbooks. And I was interested in, in neuroscience in particular. So when we came back to Boston, I, um, I got a job at, at MIT working with Jerry Leffin in neuroscience. And then at night, I went to law school, the New England School of Law, because I thought, well, I need, I'm going to need a, a way to support myself. And I didn't want, you know, I, I didn't want just to, to depend on my husband. And um, God forbid if he should leave, and, you know, what would I do? And so I was going to night law school, and I was working at MIT during the days doing neuroscience, studying the visual system. <laughs> and um, then, in fact, um, I did uh, I end up, my husband did leave, and I ended up <laughs> in the middle of law school uh, uh, with a, a young child. And so I was raising a child, I was raising a child, going to night law school, <laughs> and doing neuroscience at MIT, and I was still running, and I was doing my artwork when I could. I always had a bunch of clay in the kitchen on the counter, and I would work on that, because I loved it. I loved doing that. And, and then I practiced law for about 18 years. And Bobby, could you tell us how the running and all of your other pursuits balance each other? Oh, hmm, how they balance each other. Well, <laughs> they're all, I mean, they're all things that I love. I follow what I love. I always follow what I love. Um, and in my personal life and also in, in my professional life. And, and I can't imagine giving up any of those. So I, so I, never, I never have. Sometimes one will um, be more important at the moment, for example, practicing law, I, I, that was the way I was earning a living. And then when my, when my son went to college, I phased out my legal practice, and I thought if I don't get back to my creative work and what I really love, and so I've always had this idea that I want to make the world better, and that I want to leave something for the world that, that will, will help people to uh, change their consciousness in a way that will make things better for people uh, all over the world, you know, wh however it is. And so I've been writing books. I want to write books because I want to leave a certain number of books and I want to leave sculptures and paintings and stuff, stuff like that. So after my son went to college, then I got back to my art and I became a full-time artist. And I was actually making quite a good living as a sculptor in California. And then one of my best friends came down with ALS, and I ran again in 2001 to raise money um, for the research lab on ALS. And we, we, the group of us raised over $100,000. And then I met the head of the lab, and he was telling me about ALS and this weird disease. And so then I became interested in this. I, I guess part of it was I loved my friend and I was trying to save him. And I, uh, I began to read all, art, all articles I could get my hands on on ALS. And I, I read entire textbooks on molecular biology. And I wrote Dr. Brown in a 40-page paper on ideas that I had and, and so forth. And the, <clears throat> he hired me to, um, to continue to do that. To so that's what I'm doing now. I read two to three hundred abstracts every month, and I write memos to the lab, and I try to put all the pieces together and um, help, help the lab and help everybody come to a better understanding of what, what are some of the causes of these neurological diseases. And I know there's a huge amount of research being done on it, but I, I'm just trying to do my little part. And, and again, it's because I, 
because of this sense of love and wanting to help and make things better. So um, that's that's what I'm doing now, that and the sculpture and running. Bill, you're kind of known as the first man of the Boston Marathon. You're not Clarence Damar, but in this, this last 50 years or so, you've been numero uno in the hearts and minds of a lot of us. What do you think of this lady as the representative who's turned out to be the first woman of the Boston Marathon? I, I think she is a very, very, very worthy representative. How's that for us? <laughs> Roberta's explanations about her running, why she runs, why she runs, you know, in a nutshell, and, and I think it really, you're talking about everyone, really. We all, we all really run because we want to be out there. It, it, does have, it is a basic instinct, I think, to move, and, um, and, and we're part of nature. And, and so the good thing is, maybe we'll be the majority one day. <laughs> But I love to hear uh, Roberta's stories, except I don't want to read all those abstracts, you know? <laughs> I've always thought that uh, American marathoning has been so blessed to have leaders who were people like Bill Rogers and Frank Shorter and Joan Samuelson and Dina Castor and Shalane Flan, whoever I'm forgetting. Hello, time now. Uh, and I can't imagine anyone could have possibly been better than Bobby Gibbs. She's spiritual in every best sense of the world. Word, she's mystical, she's athletic, she's inspiring, she's quiet, she's humble, she's curious about the entire world around her. And uh, it's just fantastic that she is our first woman of the Boston Marathon. That this is her 50th anniversary of the great race in 1966. And uh, like Bill, I feel honored to have sat up here with her this evening, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing her words, and I think we should give her a real big ovation. who is a very successful real estate broker here in Hopkinton and is also uh, runs, the, uh, runs the Girls on the Run program in Hopkinton. And Doris Hamburger, who is from uh, Unibank, brand new to, the, to, uh, to Hopkinton and uh, has made a major contribution tonight. But we have a, a donation that they'd like. Oh, and Michelle, you're standing. You, Michelle, you never do this. No, no. Oh, and Michelle is always in the background. Uh, they have a, 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 a donation that they would like to make uh, to the sculpture fund. So, come on up. So, Bobby, on behalf of the um, audience tonight, we would like to present you with a check for $5,000 towards your sculpture. Wow, that's a big check. <laughs> has a sister city relationship with Marathon Greece uh, and several years ago we received a, the flame of the marathon uh, from Marathon Greece it's the only place in the world where that flame has lit has been lit continuously since we since we received the flame back in 2009 we happen to believe in Hopkinton that the spirit of the marathon resides in Hopkinton Massachusetts and we lend it out one day a year to Boston the Boston Marathon. So thank you all for being here this evening.
The first woman to ever complete the marathon, Bobby Gibb, was in Hopkinton as this year was the 50-year anniversary since she became the first female to ever cross the Boston Marathon finish line. She talked about her story to a packed house at the Hopkinton Country Club. From California, three days and three nights, uh, I subsisted on bus station chili and a bag of apples. <laughs> I got to the St. James Station and I called my parents. Uh, I had recently been married, that's why I was in San Francisco, so my husband was in the Navy. And I was against the Vietnam War, but he was in the Navy, uh, so uh, well, he was against the war too. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I came back <laughs> and I arrived. The day before the, the actually it's at night, I guess, I arrived before the race. I called my parents from the St. James Station and they said, well, where are you? And this trembly little voice, I, I went, and my mother, my mother, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in Boston. And, well, why? Well, I came to run the Boston <laughs> And of course, I hadn't told my parents that I was training for the Boston <laughs> because I knew they would think I was nuts and they would try to stop me. So the only people that knew were my boyfriend and a couple of my close women friends. Hopkinton High School welcomed runners from China. Students performed dances and songs to welcome the runners. <laughs> Just a spark of an idea that the was given to the school superintendent, Kathy McLeod, and then a whole bunch of organizations came together that included uh, Golden Pond, Dynasty Restaurant, the entire Chinese community here in Hopkinton, and a whole bunch of other organizations came together, including the 26.2 Foundation, to put on this event that had not, it was such a, a warm welcome for our visitors from Shanghai and Beijing who are here to run the marathon, uh, and Dimitri Karyakides, who lives in Shanghai, who every, oh, a, lot of, a lot of you know his father won the 50th Boston Marathon and has a statue right outside of Western Nurseries dedicated to his father's win. And really it was uh, the first warm welcome that was the group from China and Shanghai, they are really the guest of honors. and. In, having performances and food and a few short little speeches uh, was quite, it's been quite a warm event. Hopkinton Middle School hosted their annual Desire to Inspire 2.62 mile run or walk in which the students completed the annual course around the school. Yeah, we love it. It's 800 kids running, walking, uh, challenging themselves, being with their friends, uh, just enjoying the day. And it's something that we look forward to every year. And the excitement is just awesome in the stands. Um, I'm on the mic and I have kids that are coming up, they're doing shout outs, um, and they just support each other and their teachers. And uh, we had something new this year, we had a little dab off with the teachers and that went really well. Kids do this thing called the dab, which we older people don't really get, but um, it's something that you go like, that's... And so we had a little competition with the teachers and the kids seemed to enjoy that this year. Oh, uh, okay, kind of like camera. Yes. <laughs> All right, I noticed, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like uh, they got some new uh, uh, ribbons this year. Uh, oh, these are the lanyards. Last year they got little wrists things. This year they um, got lanyards for their school um, IDs and things like that. We like to just give them a little memento, and it also keeps the desire to inspire in their mind, which is um, just a movement we have at our school that we want them to inspire each other, to inspire us, and to inspire their community. So whereas we do a lot of athletic things, we also bring in a lot of speakers, and we just want the kids to think about how they can be powers of change in their community and to inspire others. All right, and seeing that this has uh, become such a tradition here at the middle school, kids must really look forward to it. They do. You can uh, just feel the excitement in the class on the day of. They all got new t-shirts this morning, um, so they get their yearly t-shirts as well, and then they wear them to other school events 
uh, for the remainder of the year. So it's, it's really a great thing. We love doing it and because we are the town that starts the marathon, we love having our own 2.62 challenge right before the marathon. So I want to thank Will Dion for being our, our first male to cross the finish line. And Kiki Fassbender, our female finisher.